Good evening, St. Peter's. Uh, I'm Father Perry Mullins, and uh, here we are with a class that we are calling the Anglican Way. Uh, do you guys want to say hello? Hello. <laughs> hello, Mother Kathy Heitman. And Father Lorenzo Galuska. Awesome. Uh, we are talking about all of the different ways that we are uh, Episcopalians and Anglicans together in uh, in this English tradition that we have inherited as the church. Um, uh, we all uh, love that tradition, but that is a really broad tradition. And so we're talking about the history of the different strands of Anglicanism and how we got to where we are today and those sorts of things. If you missed our class last week, we talked about polity. Polity means um, the, the structure and the organization of our church, the the rules that we've all agreed to in order to be church together. Uh, and we talked about the different orders of ministries of bishops and priests and deacons and lay people um, and our roles and responsibilities together in the church. So go back and uh, take a listen to that. Uh, next week, we'll be talking about baptism and confirmation. The following week, we'll be talking about Eucharistic theology, so communion. Um, and then the last week, we'll be doing a live Zoom call. Uh, that you can all log into and uh, jump into. Uh, and you can uh, Q&A us until we're blue in the face. Uh, so you can get all your questions out and we can um, uh, talk through all of it together. So hold on to your questions as you have those. Um, today, we are talking about worship. This is uh, bound to be a lively one, an exciting talk, uh, because Anglican worship is... Uh, very, very broad and diverse. Um, there are lots of different ways to worship as Anglicans. There are probably some terms uh, that you guys have heard before. Low church, high church, evangelical, charismatic, um, uh, Anglo-Catholic on the other side. Um, and those mean a whole lot of different things. Uh, but we often use them to talk about uh, how um, how simplified or how elaborate uh, church can be. Um, so uh, you are um, lucky or unlucky, I really don't know which, uh, to have um, a, uh, a really diverse clergy crew. Um, Father Lorenzo uh, is a, a Reformed Catholic and is going to talk about that sort of Reformed, low church way of worship. Uh, Mother Kathy is very broad church, uh, which kind of falls in the middle and pulls from, from different traditions in different ways. And so she'll talk us through uh, what, what worship uh, feels comfortable for her. Um, and I'm very Anglo-Catholic in my heart of hearts. Uh, and so I'll talk a little bit about Anglo-Catholicism and uh, what is uh, comforting for me about that. Um, and this will be a fun one. There'll be lots of banter. Uh, low churchmen and high churchmen uh, love to jest each other. So this will be uh, this will be fun. It used to be that back in the day they used to uh, have each other arrested and and rioted against each other. So thankfully we've come a long way since <laughs> since those controversies in England. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. Our um, you know our pilgrimage group when we were there uh, uh, last summer. Uh, now actually we were there this time last year. Uh, we saw a number of memorials um, that were erected to those who died uh, in the Reformation, in the English Civil War, in those years um, uh, right after the Reformation, when there was very little religious tolerance. Uh, so, so if you did not worship the way someone else did, uh, you could uh, find yourself you know, tied to a stake for it. Uh, it, was, it was not a good time. Um, uh, luckily, uh, that is not the case today, uh, and we can all worship together in the same church in a beautiful way. Uh, so, low churchmen, um, why don't you jump in? All right. Well, um, I thought one thing that would be helpful uh, is to talk a little bit about uh, terminology. Um, sometimes evangelical and low church are used as synonyms, um, which isn't entirely accurate, but for our purposes, I think is simple enough. And an evangelical... Um, yeah, I want to jump in for just a second there. Um, mm -hmm. And I think Mother Kathy does too, actually. I saw both <laughs> of our mouths move. 
I think a lot of the language that we use for all three of these can be unhelpful. Mm -hmm. um, so we are using pretty simplified terms today, but, yeah. but when we get into like Anglo Catholic and high church, those mean a lot more than just the way we worship as do, um, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, evangelical low church. Uh, so, um, so, so keep that in mind, right? We're, we're not using these words in the fullest sense possible. We're using them in more of like a popular definition kind of way. Uh, Mother right. Kathy, did you have something? Just that, um, in my experience, the low church has not always been tied to evangelical. Uh, I worked in, in one church that was very, very low church, but was not at all what we would consider evangelical. So it's that our Episcopal church again with its great diversity. What, um, and what is that kind of church like? So, so Anglo-Catholics tend to call that snake belly low. Um, that's uh -huh. the term that we use. Um, but you, I mean, Virginia low, right? That, that's kind of another one of those terms out there. That's a world that you're very comfortable in. Um, what, what is that like? Um, so we did use the phrase lower than a snake's belly, absolutely. Um, <laughs> but for, for example, at that time, the church that I worked at with, with that rector, uh, we were so low church that we didn't even celebrate the Eucharist every single Sunday. Uh, our main service would on occasion be a, a magnificent choral morning prayer. Uh, we had a fabulous music program and, and the music of the choral morning prayer was something that I grew, really grew to love and appreciate. Um, the vestments were, were definitely different. We always wore, even if we were celebrating Eucharist, it was a black cassock and, and a white surplice. No one ever wore a cope in, in that tradition. Um, you would be much less likely uh, to see a, a celebrant or anyone at the altar really to, to cross themselves. You never saw anyone at the gospel doing this. So a lot of those I've manual always that acts, like I've always thought that looked like we're like giving baseball signs to the runner, like <laughs> steal second, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and, and no Sanctus bells as, as well. Um, when I first came to St. Peter's, I was like, oh, wait, wh wh what's, what's that? And it was the Sanctus bells. And now it's the opposite. I, I feel like I'm thrown when the acolyte forgets to use the Sanctus bells. Um, so those are, are some of the obvious differences that someone would notice in, in watching a, a Virginia kind of low church service. Yeah, but that doesn't sound very much at all like evangelical, right? When we think of evangelical, we think of um, something something very different from that. So th the terms are just strange. Yeah, and I, one of the things that I, that is, is important to my heart is to, I think, expand people's idea of what evangelical means. I think a lot of us hear evangelical and we think, oh, that's like fundamentalism, like the religious right or like mega churches. And that may be true in, Amer in an American context, but evangelicalism is a global tradition. It's a pan-denominational tradition. And I think one of the best definitions for evangelical Christianity is what they call the, uh, the Bebbington Quadrilateral, named after a man named Bebbington. And it's four things that evangelical Christians um, hold to be particularly important. And that's uh, Biblicism, which is the belief in the scripture is inspired word of God, conversionism, uh, the idea that one must have a very genuine conversion and not just be sort of nominally involved in religion. The third one is crucicentrism, which is the centrality of Jesus's atoning sacrifice on the cross. And the fourth is activism, which includes not only evangelizing, bringing the good news to the world, but also um, letting our understanding of the good news uh, shape the way we are active in the world. So there's those four things. And, and that is, so when I say that I'm an evangelical Anglican, I'm saying that those four things are particularly important to me. And since evangelicalism has historically been a Protestant movement, it's not like we talk about Eastern Orthodox or Roman Catholic, 
Catholicism being evangelical, although they could be in the small e sense, but in the sense of being a part of evangelical Christianity, because those emphases are particularly well known within Protestantism, an evangelical Anglican who's low church, their evangelicalism might express itself in a simpler form of liturgy. So that's that's one thing for me, and I am a very proud evangelical, an evangelical Anglican, and so on. And a lot of people they say, "Oh, evangelical, that's just sort of like, uh, you know, like the Jerry Falwell or something." And I'm like, "Oh, I, you know, it's it's much more than that." <laughs> yeah. um, what does it look like for? Okay, so um, uh, when a when a a new priest is ordained, um, there's a whole lot of little stuff you have to figure out that no one tells you in seminary. Like mm -hmm. um, I, I remember Father Lorenzo and I, and, and when, you're, when you're getting ready to be ordained, um, your, your rector will go through with you a bunch of like practice masses mm -hmm. where you get to you know, try out really low church, really high church. Uh, but I remember we had this whole conversation one day uh, and, and Father Lorenzo did a, a whole Eucharist where, uh, you know, practice Eucharist, where we, um, the whole question was like, what do you do with your hands? Like. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it did, like, and, and why? Why would why would anyone do that with their hands then? Right? Mm -hmm. What's the um, what's the theology this, behind this, that? This deal yeah, here, that one. Yeah. Which yeah, to so this day, I do I do not do this. <laughs> right. You'll yeah. notice those differences between us too mm -hmm. uh, when we celebrate. We we don't all celebrate the Eucharist identically. Um, we do it in a way that I think. Um, uh, unifies us as the people of God. They're all close to each other, right? Mm -hmm. um, no one, no one is. None of the three of us are doing something crazy and wonky and silly, right? We're, we're doing the same thing, but but in our own way, uh, based on the tradition that we came out of and the theology behind it. I mean, there's a lot of theology and thought that goes into what do you do with your hands. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, Father Lorenzo, um, what what have those kind of things been like for you as you uh, as you have been getting into ordained life as a priest? I think for for me, and I think a lot of people who would identify as leaning more toward low church, it's not a, a question of what you do, but of of what you leave out, <laughs> especially in, in in and not just in presiding at the Lord's Supper, but like even as a layman when you're just in the pews worshiping. Um, it, it comes down to an economy of movement and like not necessarily doing, not crossing yourself excessively or, or um, doing other, doing this thing, uh, <laughs> um, other things. So for me, when I'm at the altar, I think it's most important is that I know what I'm doing. And this, this is honestly, if I'm being frank, like a lot of the times of what I'm during worship, my question is, would Jesus, roll his eyes at this. And if I think he would, I probably won't do it. <laughs> like if that's actually if, a really good metric. Yeah, because for me, I have to understand everything I'm doing, whether it's crossing myself or using certain gestures, I have to know what I'm doing is enhancing because you worship with your hands and with your body in the same way you worship with your heart. And if I think that something is over the top or kind of silly, um, or if I think Jesus would be like, yeah, all right, like then I wouldn't do it. And that and that's a that's not a very theological statement necessarily. That's a very it's not, but I like it. It's very idiosyncratic of what what one would consider over the top. But that, I think that a lot of low churchmen perhaps have a lower threshold for what they would consider excessive. <laughs> yeah, and and there are some theological reasons why. I'll I'll get into those in a little bit when we're talking about. Uh, Anglo-Catholicism, why a low churchman would be uncomfortable doing some of the hand motions that are really important to me, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, I, I liked what you said about um, uh, there's something in what we leave out. Um, there's something mm -hmm. very Anglican to that, right? It's very non-confrontational. Mm -hmm. um, there's, uh, there's, for instance, the story of, um, you know, the, the high churchman in the, you know, 19th, 20th, early 20th centuries, um, uh, who would, uh, you know, they'd wear these 39 button cassocks for the 39 articles of religion, and they would unbutton the ones that they disagreed with. Um, yeah. uh, kind of this, this like wow. really, really tiny, um, simple way of leaving something out, but it's a, it, it's a way of 
protest, right? Um, yeah. That's interesting. And like, there are things that there are things that each one of us uh, leaves out during church. So I'm going to tell you one of mine, and then y'all can each say something that you leave out. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, it actually comes uh, um, uh, during the uh, Sanctus, uh, holy, holy, holy. Uh, at the end, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, a lot of people cross themselves there. And I'm a high churchman. You'd think like, uh, if we're crossing ourselves, Perry's going to be with us, right? Let's do this thing. And I leave that one out uh, because the, the text from the Gospels, uh, where that comes from, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, is about Jesus coming into Jerusalem. Um, and when, when I cross myself, I feel like I'm, I'm making that more about me than I am about Christ becoming present in that moment. So that's one that, uh, that, that I leave out. If you do it, there's nothing wrong with it, right? Uh, but that's one that, that I leave out. Uh, Mother Kathy, what's something you leave out? Um, I don't know. In, in comparison to, to a high churchman, there, there would be a whole lot <laughs> that, that, that I leave out. I'm very much like Father Lorenzo. I gravitate more toward uh, restraint in what we call the manual acts at the altar. I choose very carefully um, where I do cross myself. One of the ones um, that uh, uh, I have never done is is with the um, host circling around the chalice. That is is one that I definitely leave out. It comes from a seminary professor who said, it looked like we were doing hocus pocus, never ever do that. Um, so some of these words uh, from seminary, I think, can stay with us as, as well. I would expect that if there was somebody who really knew all the different seminaries, they could watch us celebrate and, and tell us which seminary we came out of. Yeah, and probably. Which, which, at what time, who, who was teaching at that time. Yeah. The, um, so so the, the circling the host at the end, that's something that I used to do and I don't anymore. Uh, because a former rector of mine told me that it looked like Jesus was was going in for a crash landing in his helicopter. Um, <laughs> so I just stopped. I was like, oh, yep, no, nope, that, uh, that's not good. Uh, oh, and, uh, and another one, another one that, um, yeah. and he stretched out his, his arms okay. in the hardwood of the uh, cross. Yeah. I, I don't think we're, we're up there as, as it, we're, we're Jesus stretching out our arms. I, I, uh-huh. Don't do that one either. I have known priests on that one. Um, so a, a rector of mine from San Antonio when I was down there, you know, would, would keep his orans position. That's what this is called, by the way. Uh, when the priest holds their hands up um, in some form like this, right? Yeah. Um, it's called the orans. And they, we hold our hands up like that when we're praying on behalf of the congregation. Um, I want you all to imagine, right, uh, a church that had an east facing altar. So the priest with their back turned to the congregation, praying like this, sort of pushing all the prayers up, up to God, right? Um, that's, the, that's the image that, uh, that always comes to mind for me, but it's uh, whatever position we're in, whether we're east or west facing or, um, or, or anything, right? Uh, that's a position that a priest, uh, really that any, any person praying on behalf of a group of people uses, it's not just a priest. Um, yeah, but I, so I've, I've known priests, a rector from San Antonio who, when, when he got to those words would stretch out his arms really wide. And I always kind of felt uncomfortable. Yeah. And I know a priest in Dallas who, when he gets to those words, drops his hands down to his sides because he didn't want any part of that. And that also makes me uncomfortable. And so I just kind of keep my hands still. Um, I I don't know. (laughs) Hmm. Um, Father Lorenzo, something you uh, leave out? I think um, an important part of this discussion is not just manual acts during the liturgy, but when you look at the polarities of low church and high church, how that also affects the realm of piety or spirituality. So it's not just during the liturgy. So like someone who leans more low church would not, for instance, pray to Mary or to the saints or, or more accurately would ask them to pray for them. I guess that would be the more accurate way of saying it. 
but like, or like Marian devotion, you would find praying the rosary and praying Marian prayers in a high church context, whereas low churchmen or women typically don't do that. So that's like, for me, that is something like, out, obviously the liturgy doesn't really have any prayers to anyone but, but God the Father. Um, but even outside the liturgy, like praying the rosary or praying any prayers addressed to Mary or the saints, that's not something I do. And that's a part of, so it's not, not just the realm of like, what do we do with our hands during the liturgy, but right. even in the realm of what we're comfortable with in, in piety and sp our personal spirituality. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anything else on um, uh, evangelical, low church, reformed kind of tradition, Father Lorenzo? I mean, there's a lot, I guess, but... I think that's good for now. Let's hear about the, the broad church tradition. <laughs> so uh, for me, is it, it, in broad church, I have a, a caveat right, right at the start and that there are parts of low church that I enjoy and part of high church that I enjoy. My steady diet is broad church, uh, but I also really enjoy incense when my asthma isn't acting up. Truth be told, I enjoy wearing a coat a couple of times during the year. Um, I've, I've, I've managed to get her wearing one uh, a couple times recently. I, the thing that, that I really do enjoy about the, the high church is it it seems to appeal to all the senses. I like the way that, that uh, it, it uh, appeals to the sense of smell with the incense, the bells with the uh, sense of sound, uh, visually with, with the wonderful vestment. The, the high church to me gives, gives the tiniest hint of, of what worship might be like in, in heaven, and I enjoy that. Um, I also enjoy a, a service that is absolutely stripped down. There was a time when I used to go to um, a service that, that took place in, in a barn that was led by brothers, and they would open up the barn door, and all that there was to look at was, was the fields outside and the, the barest table for an altar. And there were times when I would appreciate that very much. For the steady diet, though, I, I think it's the broad church where I fit most naturally, where there's um, hints toward high church, hints toward low church, but is, is really down the middle. Um, when we talk about St. Peter's and our liturgy there, I think it's somewhere between broad church and, and high church, kind of right in there. And that's the place where I, I am very, very comfortable. Yeah. Um, I had a professor in seminary, you talked about sometimes really appreciating things being stripped down and sometimes wanting them a little, uh, a little more um, uh, involved. Uh, that's, just, that's just the rhythms of human life. You're playing out mm -hmm. normal rhythms of human life in your, in your worship, which we should. Um, so uh, my professor in seminary, his, uh, his analogy for that was, and, and I love this analogy because it's culinary and that's kind of my thing lately. Um, he said, you know, sometimes you want to you want to do a, a five course meal and, you know, make the souffle and make sure that it doesn't fall and, you know, have every little detail, mm -hmm. the plating beautiful and everything, everything just as 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 big and grand as you can get it. And sometimes you come home at the end of the day and and you just need to open a blue box and make some macaroni and cheese. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and and both will sustain you, and both are good for you, and you'll enjoy both of them. Um, and and you kind of need both at different times. You said a, a word in there that really st stood out to me, and that was the word detail. I like liturgy that shows attention to detail. 
whether it's low church, broad church, or high church, it's important to me that liturgy is done in a very thoughtful and deliberate way, while, while still allowing for the spontaneity of, of life that comes into our services. But I, I like liturgy that, that's well done. Where it falls high church, low church might not be as important. Hmm. Yeah. Point. Yeah, there's something to that. I was talking to uh, Britain this morning, um, a member of our parish, and um, uh, we were we were actually talking a little bit about this. Um, uh, he didn't he didn't know that we were filming this later today, and I told him this was it was perfect. It helped me get my head around it uh, beforehand. Um, but we were talking a little bit about this, and uh, and he said, right, is there a is there a really clear broad church um, kind of line of theology or and, and I. I really struggled to come up with something. I, I, really, I, I said no, but, but I also said it is a strain in Anglicanism, right? I, 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 I want to claim that it is its own thing, maybe not as traditionally so as the other two, but it is its own thing. Um, and yet, I really struggle, I really struggle to know um, the why piece, right? On, on, mm -hmm. on evangelical and low church, there are reasons why you do certain things. And on Anglo-Catholic, there are reasons why you do certain things. Um, and the reasons, the, there are reasons in, in a, a broad church theology, but they're, they don't all come from the same place, I think. Would you say that's true, Kathy? I don't know. I think the tough part with broad church, both theologically and in regard to the the actual um, acts that, that occur is that it's almost defined more by what it's not, by what's on the two ends, with, with the broad church coming down the middle between low church and high church. I think, I think there's less of a theological justification and more of, um, when you really look at it, it's in, in the Church of England, it's called uh, central church rather than broad church. Right. And when you look at the 20th century, most Church of England parishes throughout England were not markedly high church or low church. Most of them were sort of in the middle. And I think that had, had to do with a sort of English sense of propriety and like not being too extreme more than any theological justification. I think that most parish churches in the Church of England are sort of in the middle, not because of any uh, I mean, I'm sure there are theological convictions about it, but I think it's more just an English sense of not wanting to be too extreme. So there is something very Anglican about that, very English mm -hmm. about that. Um, I, I also, I, the, the more I think through different broad church uh, convictions, um, the, the more I think that... Um, there's there's great theological justification there. I mean, I, I really most of the context I found myself serving in, though I would identify myself as an Anglo-Catholic, have been pretty broad church, um, and there have been great theological justifications along the way. They've just been pulled out of different traditions and sort of um, gathered together in actually a pretty beautiful way. Hmm. It was a hooker who said. I don't know if he said this and it was included in his colic for his feast day or if someone just said this about him. They say that we, we are reformed and Catholic not as a compromise for the sake of unity, but a comprehension for the sake of truth. Not that you say, well, we're, as, as Anglicans, as Episcopalians, we're both reformed and Catholic, not compromising so we can fit everyone together, but comprehending because the Christian faith its reformed emphases and its Catholic emphases are necessary to really comprehend Christian truth. And I think, I don't know if he said that or if someone just said that about him, but um, it's, it's in the call like for Richard Hooker's feast day. I like it either way. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, so high church, uh, Anglo Catholicism. Um, I think there are a couple of historical things that help us to understand Anglo-Catholicism uh, a little bit better. Um, first is that an Anglo-Catholic will say 
that there has always been, uh, since the first century, uh, a, a Catholic church in England that is both decidedly Catholic and decidedly uh, English. Um, the English church developed in its own ways, partially because it's you know separated from the continent of Europe, um, uh, and uh, also partially because of the uh, the number of uh, cultures that were that were involved in developing uh, you know modern English culture. Um, and you find all of that in the in the church as well. Um, an Anglo-Catholic would say that um, uh, that uh, there has always been that sort of English Catholic Church, and we are still a part of that uh, tradition today. Planted by the apostles, uh, nurtured by different uh, members of Christianity through the ages. Um, some Anglo-Catholics uh, today. Um, would still reach for reunification with Rome, um, and others would reach for um, something that's more akin to a, a, um, a mutual recognition of one of one another while remaining um, uh, uh, autonomous, separate. Um, the latter is more where I fall. Um, uh, and, and it's because I think that the English church developed so differently and uh, and was built so differently that that I don't know that a Roman structure um, was ever really going to work in in uh, England and of course uh, the American church inherits um, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, English characteristics um, well the mutual recognition goes one direction but not the other I mean I, I yeah. think that yeah. Anglicans I mean, I, I, you may find some some very sort of anti-Catholic Puritan types in Anglicanism, but but not many. I think that Anglicanism recognizes that the Roman Catholic Church is a true church, that that Catholics are a part of the church, um, whereas the Catholic Church has said that the Anglican Church is not a part of the true church, that they are the true church, and even even that that Anglican holy orders are null and void. So, so that, that came much later. Yes, it did. But so, um, so I think the mutual recognition is, is much more, in terms of recognition, it's going one direction, but not the other. Yeah, Anglicans will even say that the Pope is the Bishop of Rome. Um, I mean, we, we don't really question that. Um, he is uh, the we just, yeah. Right, we just question whether there is sort of universal authority attributed to the Pope, and, and we would say no. Um, so the Eastern Orthodox churches, we talked about this a little bit last week, they developed autonomously, um, and there was, there was a, a component of locality that was really important to the church. Um, you, had to be able, uh, you had to be able to work together in your own context, um, and, uh, and that's, I think that's important in, uh, in the Church of England. It's, it's even important for a lot of Anglo-Catholics, who I think a lot of people think have these sort of Roman tendencies. Um, but we have those not because we wish we were Roman Catholic. We're happy that we're Anglican. We're Anglican for, for good reasons, right? Uh, but because those are things that are, that are ancient, that we're claiming, that we're saying are from our tradition, are from our English uh, Catholic tradition. Um, so there's a historical component there. Um, the other thing that I think um, is really important to understand this is sort of that late 19th, early 20th century piece, um, is that uh, the church in England was not generally always very high church, not even as mm -hmm. high church or Anglo-Catholic as it is today. Um, when you get to that late 19th, early 20th century uh, period, right, the, the country had just gone through, England had just gone through uh, the Industrial Revolution and uh, lives had very drastically changed very quickly. Uh, people were working long hours in, uh, in uh, factories. Uh, children were working at a very young age, uh, again, in factories, right? They may have been working in fields before that, but there's something very different and, uh, and almost dehumanizing about the, the early factory experience. Um, wages were low. People were living in, in poverty. Um, uh, there's a sense that culturally they had um, uh, they had they had seen the industrial revolution happen and grabbed on so quickly uh, 
for the benefit of economy, of wealth, of all those sorts of things, but had forgotten a bit of their humanity. You know? um, and so the, there's a, uh, an Anglo-Catholic movement called the Oxford Movement, where these very high church priests in England went out and took parishes in the slums near the factories uh, and, and did very beautiful worship. Um, and, you know, carried monstrances through the streets in front of the factories and cried out against the injustice that was happening, uh, uh, you know, in the world uh, right around them. And so there's a, there's a sense that Anglo-Catholicism needs to be tied uh, to all of that, to beauty and liturgy, to lots of detail, to, to um, gorgeous music, uh, but also to that, that justice component. It's, it's a, um, a deep part of who we are as Anglo-Catholics. So you'll often find uh, Anglo-Catholics who are very fussy about their worship and their music and right our, I should say our, I'm including myself in this, um, who are very fussy about all these things, but also have this, uh, because, of, because of the theology that makes that happen, also have this deep commitment um, uh, to justice and to um, uh, mutual bonds of love among the church and, and things that are going to help us grow in, in our in our lives and in our faith. Um, so uh, being an Anglo-Catholic, you see me do lots of funny things, right? Um, you wear funny hats. I wear a lot of yeah. funny hats. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, and I guess all the funny hats uh, that I've worn at St. Peter's so far uh, are um, our uh, high church hats. Uh, the Beretta is uh, an Italian juridical hat. Uh, the Zacchetto, that kind of uh, the one you see the Pope wearing, um, that goes over what would have been a priest's tonsure back in the day um, to, to keep his bald spot warm, um, uh, reminds a priest that he is under authority. Um, so those are very high church hats. There are other more low church hats. The Canterbury uh, a Saturno, a Canterbury cap, right? Um, there are some out there that are uh, that are very low church, and and some of them more practical, um, like a like a good low churchman, right? A Saturno, uh, like like the word Saturn, right, is a brimmed hat. It's going to keep the uh, the sun off your neck. And a Canterbury cap, if you're in a cold English cathedral, is going to keep you warm. Um, so there's something to that. Um, smells and bells is a term that I think people hear a lot. It means incense and, and refers to the Sanctus bells or the Angelus bells, or we have all sorts of bells, right? We, we love our bells. <laughs> um, uh, so um, um, I, think, I think Mother Kathy said it really well earlier, actually. It, it has to do with finding a way to, to um, gather up things and worship in this physical uh, this physical way that that brings worship into all of our senses, um, and I think that's a lot of what um, a lot of what being an, an Anglo Catholic uh, is about. At least the beauty that drew me to it. Um, there's also a lot of uh, deep devotion and historical prayer. Um, you know, growing up, I would watch my priest vest before services and put on all the pieces, and every one has uh, has this beautiful prayer that goes with it. Um, and I've got those memorized now and I do my best to, to say them, um, uh, you know, when we have enough acolytes and when we're not stressed about, uh, um, you know, trying to make sure everything's right for worship. Uh, uh, saying those prayers is a really important part of, um, of my devotion. Uh, and there's something old and historical and, and Catholic about that. Um, I should also, since Father Lorenzo said something about the words we're using, I should say something about the word uh, Catholic. Um, uh, I push back against people who, who say, who just say Catholic and mean Roman Catholic. Um, I don't love that because there, there are a lot of Catholic traditions that don't all point back to Rome like ours. Um, so, uh, so I will always say Roman Catholic if I'm talking about someone who is uh, Roman Catholic. Uh, but the word Catholic, it means universal. Um, and the way I think about that, it has to do with connectedness. Um, so, uh, so it's a recognition of all of our church's interconnectedness in ways that we don't even realize. 
and the interconnectedness of people in those churches in ways that we don't even realize. And even the interconnectedness of our lives to those of the saints who have gone before us, um, our interconnectedness into the life of heaven. So Father Lorenzo brought up, um, you know, asking the saints to pray for us. Uh, an Anglo-Catholic looks at that just like asking, um, you know, anyone else to pray for us. I could say, Mother Kathy, uh, you know, pray for, pray for me. I'm, I'm not feeling well. Pray for me to get better, right? Um, an Anglo-Catholic thinks about our connectedness in such a way that we could also say, St. Peter, pray for me. I'm not feeling well. Um, uh, pray for me to get better. Um, uh, and so it's um, it's not a it's not a worship of of saints or Mary. It's um, it, it's it's feeling that connectedness in the church. That's helpful. So that's um, that's a really quick version of of high church. Um, anything anything else that y'all are thinking about low church, high church, broad church that you want to bring up today? I think I think the important thing is that that um, for for me, um, and, and, and this is really true that 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 kind of joke that I made at the beginning. People really did like get arrested for things as simple as like putting two candles on the altar, or even calling it an altar because that has a sort of sacrificial connotation. You would call it the holy table, and there were in the Church of England, if you put candles on the holy table, you could get imprisoned for that. Um, and I, I'm thankfully we have really got beyond that. And I think that a lot of um, when we talk about yeah, church, I love candles on the altar, so I'd be right. in trouble. Well, and also there's a practical. I mean, you know, so they help you see better. You know, if it's <laughs> there is a reason. <laughs> but um, I think we've really gotten beyond that. And I think when you look at churchmanship, especially in the Episcopal Church, when we're such a small church compared to, um, I mean, I think there's what two million Episcopalians, maybe a little less. Yeah. Um, well, and and be clear, we're we're a small, smaller in in the United States. That, yeah, that's what I meant. The Anglican right. Communion is quite large, but I mean, the Episcopal Church in the United States, we're we're so much smaller. We really don't have the luxury to really argue among ourselves. So right. for for me, when I look at churchmanship, that's more of a statement of what one finds comfortable or preferable, or you know, for me, I find Reformed theology fascinating. That doesn't mean that Anglo-Catholic theology is all bunk. It just means I don't necessarily find it as interesting or as nourishing. So for me to say I lean low church is not like everyone else is wrong. It just means this is what I prefer and what I find more comfortable in my own spirituality and theology. And I think that when looking at churchmanship through that lens, it's much more inclusive of saying, you know, Father Perry leans this way because of because that's what he prefers or what he finds more interesting or, or more nourishing. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's not exclusive. It's just an acknowledgement of, of one's own um, formation and one's own preferences. So I found that it's often, um, it's not so much about preferences. It's more about formation, actually. Mm -hmm. um, that we tend, to, uh, we tend to latch onto and hold on to the tradition that was handed on to us. Um, so I grew up in a very Anglo-Catholic setting um, with, uh, with Christians that I admire and love, faithful, faithful people that are amazing um, and have, have made me the person that I am today. And they were high church. Uh, and, and that's the tradition that they handed on to me. Um, there's something really beautiful and, and good about that, um, uh, that we all sort of hold on to that which has been handed on to us. And as long as Jesus mm -hmm. is, um, is the main thing that mm -hmm. was handed on to us, yeah. um, the details uh, are, are good and helpful, um, but um, they're not the most important thing. Mm -hmm. um, that would be a great place to end, but there's one other quick thing that I wanna say. There's a huge piece of this that we have left out. Uh, and it's because we have a whole week on it coming up two weeks from now. Um, the, the theology of the Eucharist for mm -hmm. a, a low churchman and a high churchman are very, very different. Uh, but we, we recognize that that will take another 45 minutes. Um, and so we're going to do a, a whole week on that uh, coming up two weeks from now. Next week, we're talking 
uh, baptism and confirmation, which, uh, which is an interesting one historically and will be fun. Um, and then uh, Eucharist. Um, did I miss one in there? I always seem to miss one. No, it was next, next week is baptism and confirmation, okay. then Eucharist, then the, the live session. And then the our questions. live questions. Q&A. That's right. So we'll do a live Q&A uh, session at the end. Uh, all right. Um, Mother Kathy, would you pray for us? Yes. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with you. Let us pray. Holy and mighty God, we thank you for the gift of worship. We thank you for the variety of it as it is expressed in the Anglican tradition and in all of our churches in the Episcopal Church. We ask, dear Lord, that you continue to be so present with us in our worship, especially right now when we cannot always be together. And we ask that you uh, continue to strengthen the bonds of our worshiping community in all these things we pray in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Uh, All right. St. Peter's, we miss you and we love you and we can't wait until we are uh, back together again. We will see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye all.